grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today's passage from Luke is a difficult one. There's no two ways around that. Jesus is teaching a very hard truth with hard words that are intended to shock and to shake us up a little bit. Whenever we come across one of these really difficult passages in Scripture, it's always a legitimate question to say, why bother to study it? I think there's really two reasons. One, whenever there's a hard passage one like this one, I, uh, I almost feel duty-bound to talk about it, because I imagine myself if I ever attended a mosque or a synagogue or a Sikh temple, and they read some passage that sounded to my ears just bizarre, and everybody just kind of nodded and kept moving along, I'd be looking around me and, what's going on here? What kind of weird people are these? And so I feel like for the sake of our Christian witness, it's, uh, it's almost a duty to take these difficult passages of Scripture and really wrestle with them understand what's being taught, so that if anybody ever comes to us and asks us, what on earth was going on here? We've got some shot at making an a, a intelligible answer. But there's a second reason, and I think it's an even more important one. I've shared this idea before, but I think that the most difficult passages are often the most rewarding. The same way that the most difficult classes you have to take are usually the ones in which you learn the most. The most difficult coaches and teachers are usually the ones that teach you the most. And the most difficult experiences in life are usually the times that you grow the most. In the same way, I believe that the most difficult passages are the ones that benefit us the most in our lives of faith in Christ. So let's spend a little bit of time listening today as Jesus teaches us about the cost of discipleship. And right out of the gate, we get a pretty disorienting passage. Reading Luke chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, and feel free to follow along on the back of your bulletin. It says, Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple." Why on earth would Jesus tell us to hate our parents, our siblings, our spouses, our children? Not only is that teaching extremely distasteful on any human level, but it goes against Bible passages that we know. We know from the Ten Commandments that we're supposed to honor our father and mother. We know from Ephesians that wives and husbands are supposed to love and cherish one another, and that parents are supposed to nurture and care for children. So why on earth would Jesus tell us to hate our families? Now, here is one of those passages where a little deeper knowledge of the original language really can't help. Because the word that Jesus is using here for hate is a little more nuanced in the original Greek. It has two different meanings. One is the one that we're familiar with, sort of a categorical and very intense dislike of something. The same way that you would say you hate Sickness, or you hate suffering, or you hate seasonal allergies. Nobody likes these things. That's one legitimate use of the word hate. But the other one is a little more complex, a little more nuanced. And let me give you an example to, uh, to show you how this word could be used. So imagine yourself, and you're going to a Mexican restaurant. You order for yourself a taco, and the next question that the server asks you, if you go to a Mexican restaurant, you order a taco, they say, Chicken or beef, right? Now, actually, let's do some audience participation. How many of you ordering a taco would order chicken? All right, very good. So, this illustrates the way the word hate is used in the, in, in, uh, in the Greek language and the fact that we have no real English equivalent. Those of you who just put your hand up, those of you who just chose or preferred chicken, what did you do to beef? In English, you just sort of didn't choose it. You didn't prefer it. In Greek, you hated it. Now, that doesn't mean that next time you go to a restaurant, you might not order a beef taco. It doesn't mean that you never want a beef taco. It doesn't mean that the idea of a beef taco makes you sick. Although, if you've watched some of the news reports, beware, if you order beef, you might not be getting beef. But the fact of the matter is, the way the word in Greek is used, you chose chicken and hated beef. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll never want beef. 
You see what I mean? It's a more nuanced sense of the word. That item which did not get chosen, which was not preferred, which came in second place, is the item that you hated. I honestly believe that's the way Jesus is using the word hate here. So going back to our passage, how does that help us to understand what Jesus is saying? When Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his family or even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That doesn't mean that you all of a sudden can throw all of your family duties and responsibilities out the window. It doesn't mean that Jesus is now teaching us to be jerks to those that we're most closely genetically related to. Instead, it means something far deeper. It means that if you would be a disciple of Christ, then you may face times where you will have to choose Christ, your faith in Him, and your obedience to His teaching over and above your family. That just like you choose chicken and hate beef, there are times that you may need to choose Christ and hate, by that definition, your family. God willing, these times will be few and far between, but there may well be times where you have to value Christ and what He has given over your family. That is not an easy truth. That is a costly truth. It is an uncomfortable truth. But it's also why we had that wacky passage just a couple of weeks ago that talked about I've not come to bring peace but a sword and to divide son against father and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Remember that passage? That's why Jesus was talking about that. Because polite people acknowledge, right, you're not supposed to talk about religion in mixed company. Religion has the ability to divide. Religion has the ability to make things awkward, to splinter our relationships with our family, because sometimes you have to choose Christ and thus hate your family. That's the cost of discipleship, and that cost is hard. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on, reading verse 27. Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple." Now, as Christians, we hear so much talk about the cross, and we see so many different images of the cross, that sometimes it sort of softens the edge of what really happened on a cross. Those who lived under Roman rule, nothing softened those edges. They knew full well, for they had seen far too often, that dying on a cross was the most painful, drawn-out, humiliating, and excruciating death that had ever been designed. In fact, the word excruciating has right in the middle the Latin word for cross, crucius, right? Excruciating. Nothing softened the edges of the idea of bearing a cross because one who carried a cross was carrying it to a sudden and unmerciful death. And Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Who in their right mind would ever undertake something that they knew would lead to a cross. But that is the cost of discipleship, and that cost is hard. Jesus now continues with some examples that can only be considered by anyone with any business or sales background. Bad salesmanship. Plain and simple, bad salesmanship. If you've ever been to a used car lot, if you've ever watched a late night infomercial, you know that the very last piece of information that any salesman is interested in giving you is what? The price. Boy, sometimes you got to squeeze it out of them, right? They'll tell you how revolutionary this item is, how you'll, you'll scratch your head and wonder how you ever survived without it, how much greater it is than any of its competitors. But boy, is it hard to nail them down to find out exactly how much it's going to cost. Jesus is doing the opposite. He's warning people about the cost of discipleship right up front. He uses some examples. He says, just like a person who's undertaking a new building, you never start unless you're certain you have enough to cover the cost so that you'll be able to finish. And just ask anyone who works in construction how ugly things get when the money runs out halfway through. And they'll tell you this is just as true now as it was then. Or just like a good general who won't go into battle unless he knows that he has the troops and the supply lines that he needs to make victory at least possible. We're not supposed to enter any efforts unprepared or unexamined or unplanned. We must consider the cost, and that cost is steep. Jesus concludes, verse 33, Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, who does not hate everything, 
when compared to Christ, cannot be my disciple. Now we begin to see why Jesus is being so harsh. It's called truth in advertising. He isn't going to candy coat things, isn't going to string his disciples along with promises of an easy life and simple victories. The cost of discipleship is high. One of my favorite books is actually titled that, The Cost of Discipleship. It was written by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who lived in Germany in the middle of the 1900s. In it he wrote, when Jesus bids a man to come, he bids him to come and die. And Bonhoeffer proved those words perfectly well because not long after writing them, because of his opposition to the Nazi church, he was put into a concentration camp and he indeed died. Jesus wants us to know this is no Sunday picnic he's inviting us to. There will be opposition, frustration, persecution, challenge. These things will come from within us, the very sinful nature that lives inside of us. They will come from the world around us, which does not understand and often does not care to understand what it is that we believe. And they will come from Satan himself, who has never stopped opposing the truth of the gospel. There is a cost to discipleship, and that cost is great. Nothing can be completely spared. We must be willing to sacrifice our comfortable family relationships, even our own lives, as we take up the cross. And why should we consider the cost so carefully? Well, Jesus uses a simple metaphor, and one that he uses elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us, verses 34 and 35, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness ever be restored? It's of no use either for the soil or even the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears, let him hear. If we lose our saltiness, if we run out of gas, or turn back, or throw in the towel, or whatever metaphor you want to use, if we do not see our discipleship through to the very end, then that discipleship will yield nothing, will be less than useless, less than worse, worthless. Now how's that for a bummer of a sermon on a beautiful Sunday morning? Yes, I am. Who really wants to hear this and then dive back into the weekly challenges of work and school and family relationships and so forth? What good could possibly come from this passage which Jesus is teaching today? I agree. It's a bummer. Until you realize exactly whom Jesus is describing in these passages. Jesus is describing the perfect disciple. And quite frankly, and in all honesty, that's not you, and it's not me. Try as we might, we can never be perfect. We will underestimate the cost, we will give in, we will run out of steam. It is inevitable within this life. It doesn't let us off the hook, but it is certain to happen. But instead, think of the one man who was willing to be forsaken by his father. Who was willing to take up his cross, quite literally. Who was willing to hate everything in this life. Think of Christ, because ultimately, this is about Jesus and what he did. Jesus gave up heaven and his perfect relationship with the Father to become human. When he hung on the cross for our sins, he was forsaken by his Father. When he hated this world enough to die an accursed death. And yet Jesus loved this world enough to give us his victory. For to all who believe in him, to all who take up their cross, his cross, and follow him, life is promised, and eternity is certain. The road may, in fact the road will at times, be hard. Family strife may result, so too may financial burden, or vocational uncertainty, or cultural criticism. It's even possible that you will face actual persecution and death, as many of our brothers and sisters around the world do. But these are small prices to pay when the reward is infinite, the reward is guaranteed, and the reward is eternal. Bonhoeffer told us that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. But it also reminds me of another Christian who lived just about the same time, a Christian who left his safety behind to carry the gospel message to a deadly and completely unchristian tribe. That Christian was a missionary named Jim Elliot. And while Bonhoeffer tells us that when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die, Jim Elliot said, in some beautiful words, He is no fool 
who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So consider the cost, my friends. We don't candy coat it. We don't sugar coat it. We don't pretend it's not there. Consider the cost, for discipleship is certainly not easy. But then, consider that Christ has already paid that cost in full, so that you may go forth in utter peace, in utter certainty, in the face of all hardships, certain that the disciple who is faithful even unto death shall be awarded the crown of eternal life. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in this truth, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.